Okay, so now we we touch on the last uh, topic of the course, and we finish our discussion of uh, renormalization group flow in the Wilson's approach. So in the last lecture, we went through the decimation procedure. And let me remind you just the basic idea of decimation procedure. The decimation procedure consists of taking the sphere of momenta within which the fields are defined, uh, and you can define the field as the inverse Fourier transform of the Fourier transform. And they are naturally defined up to a cutoff scale lambda. And the idea is just to split this integral into two parts, one from zero to a small shell B lambda, and one from the small shell and the end of the momentum scale, and explicitly perform the integration of the small span. Now, the fact that you use a small parameter is essential to recover locality. I want to say this uh, very clearly, uh, and it will become clear in a couple of uh, phrases. But, but I want to emphasize at this stage that we assume that B was a parameter that was close to 1, so that B lambda over lambda is close to 1, so to say. Okay, so the idea was to split the path integral into small components, which are this one, and large components, which are this one, and then rearrange the terms in the Hamiltonian in such a way that the result was an integral over small components of my original or so-called plus an effective interaction term which depends only on the small components and this term e to the minus this if you want was actually the result of performing explicitly the integration over the shell over the hard fields. How did we perform the integration of the hard fields? Well, we look at all the terms that emerge in the V effective. Sorry, in the so basically we look at the full Hamiltonian and we took away the part that depends only on the small part and we call this delta H which depends on the small and hard, and treated this as dynamical, meaning by dynamical fields, I mean fields we integrate over, and this is external sources. And these are the analog of the J fields we introduced in the Vic theorem. And then, in order to evaluate this, we, we evaluated the path integral and perturbation theory. And remember, we discussed that to evaluate a path integral Z, you have both connected and disconnected graphs. You have like, uh, this is 0 plus, I don't know, this, but also this, and I don't know, this, very good in drawing, okay, and so on, with coefficients in front that, of course, come from the exact evaluations of the contractions. But when you go up and evaluate the logarithm of this quantity, which we define as uh, V effective, which is not uh, and we define it as z. So in other words, when we take v effective to be the negative of the logarithm of z, you're taking the negative of the logarithm of these diagrams. And the result of taking the logarithm of this diagram is that this is all the disconnected graphs magically cancel out order by order in perturbation theory. And something you can convince yourself by going to leading order, for instance. In leading order, Z 
is just one plus the only diagram that there is in linear order is a connected graph. So if you are a tree level, you're not um, you're not concerned about this distinction. But when you go to h bar squared, then you have one plus this plus this and this a lambda squared, but also with the coefficients, but also the double disconnected. When you go and take the logarithm of this guy, then you see you can you when you take the logarithm of this log of one plus x right is to lead in order x which means that you sum these ones right and then if you look at the Taylor expansion I'm look I'm I'm uh, looking it up as I speak. Taylor. So let's do it here. One second. I think I have a Mathematica file. I don't want to do the derivatives in my hand. Of course, it could take me two minutes to do it, but I'm lazy. So let me do it with Mathematica. Is it coming up? Come on. Okay. It would have taken me less to do the calculation by hands, but now it's too late. No documentation. Document. Okay. Series log one plus x. X comma zero comma two. Okay, second order. Okay, so I get a negative one half square. Now, when I go to one half square here, I get contributions. So one one contribution I get is from all this term here that I outline in in um, in red, and I place it here. So I place like this plus ta ta ta, this plus ta ta ta, this, this. That's my x. That then I have my x squared. When I do the x squared, I get the same term squared divided by two. So the same diagram squared. But I don't need to include all of them, because if I square this diagram, some of them are going to be to order lambda fourth. Because all the lambda square diagram, when I square them, they become lambda fourth. And suppose I'm interested only at lambda square order. So the only term that I need to square here, if I'm interested in, 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 in the order lambda square, is this one right, which is the square of this diagram here, will give me this. Now, in addition to taking this term, sorry, this term to square, to generate the order terms that are order lambda square, I will also have to expand the contribution to order lambda square in x, because I want to stop at order lambda square. So when I expand the, the same object on the lambda square, you see already a magic appears because anything that comes square does not contain, so anything that comes with x square does not contain topologically connected diagrams. Why? Because taking a square of a, of a quantity implies multiplying two integrals, for instance, in dz1 and dz2, and these are in disconnected diagrams. So the only terms to lambda square that really are genuinely topologically connected come from the original expansion to leading order at order lambda square. So 
this is so in this original expansion toward the lambda square there will be topologically connected terms and topologically disconnected but the topologically disconnected will be cancelled when I take the logarithm to order x squared from the lowest order diagrams right taken square so order by order in perturbation theory meaning if I stop up to order lambda square all the diagrams that appear to lambda square are only the topologically connected because the topologically disconnected will cancel out there will be a cancellation between the order lambda square topologically disconnected in the linear term in the Taylor expansion and to the order lambda exponentiated to the second power in the second order of the logarithmic expansion. So there are two expansions here, one over lambda and one over logarithms, in terms of logarithms. The higher order in the logarithm expansion, in this case x squared, cancels out the topologically disconnected terms in the order lambda squares at the lower order in the Taylor expansion. It sounds confusing, but if you really think about the fact that there are two expansions, one in lambda and one is the expansion in logarithms, and they combine in such a way that any time you take something square, it's like taking a, a diagram and making a copy of it and making a disconnected diagrams, then you start understanding where the cancellation comes from. There is no simple way to do this other than just sit down and do the order x square, lambda square calculation explicitly and see that exactly each term cancels. And it's a pain of the neck, but I do encourage you to so. So exercise for students. And when I mean exercise for students, it's something that might come up in the... This is a... Remember, this falls under the category questions I was used to giving as exams question without warning before in the regular version of the course where I had more time to you know, do things on the board and be uh, interacting with students, letting the student try and then answering whatever they got stuck, right? In, when I was giving this course, normally I would give this as an exercise maybe during the course or something very close to it. And then in the middle of the lecture, I would ask, uh, you know, somebody to come on the board and try to do it. We cannot do that. And therefore, I leave to you as an exercise to show that in, land, in five to the fourth when you evaluate this, go and compute, show, show that the perturbity expansion of Z sorry, log z to order lambda square contains no topologically disconnected graph or loop, loop graph. And it's, you know, my personal induction principle is true for one, true for two, true always, which of course is not a theorem, but I, I mean by that, if you can prove it with a leading order, which is trivial, there's no disconnected graph to order lambda, you can still prove it to order lambda square. I don't care if you don't have in your hands the general proof, which would take you hours of, you know, induction principles and stuff, I think you believe where the cancellation comes from, and you can take that for granted. So that's how we set up the calculation of the effective action and in the effective action we had terms to compute which contains given powers of um, of uh, fast and slow fields and the idea was to treat the slow fields as sources and this is dynamical and we were discovering that this type of interaction were generating new vertices for instance this was generating a vertex in which basically you had a loop diagram and this loop diagram coming from contracting these five fields with themselves was just basically a number 
As a result of which the original mass square term was getting a correction because of the loop data. On the other hand, we also discovered doing things uh, explicitly, or not really explicitly, sketching, that there were terms like, uh, I don't know, I think we were doing this term. Yes. This term, of course, uh, does not lead any contribution to the lambda square, because I cannot contract the hard fields by itself. But when you go to second order, lambda square, you get three of them two of them, sorry, which corresponds to having three sources, one, two, three, one, two, three, two integrals, dz1, dz2, and then you would contract these two fields, which would induce a propagator for hard modes from z1 to z2, right? Now, this is a non-local vertex, but now comes at play the fact that you used b to be a number close to lambda, which means that this is a hard scale, or in other words, a short distance with respect to the scale, which is characteristic of the effective theory, which basically means you can expand this to, low, to let it become basically a local vertex. So now when you do the calculation, you realize it very clearly that you get the result and if you take the leading order in a 1 over b lambda expansion, the vertex becomes local, and you start generating terms like this. So, second exercise. Compute. the effective vertex which comes, which arises from this term. I think I can even trace back what is the corresponding power let me give you a look. Uh, we get something like uh, one sixth. This is the term that enters the in delta H, and you want to expand Z to order lambda square. This term will contribute to the order lambda square because of what I just said, and I ask you to compute this loop, this diagram, the one that I sketched before. So to compute this diagram here, and show that for B getting close to 1, this diagram, this diagram, the evaluation of this diagram gives rise to phi to the six vertex. And I mean computed mathematically, not graphically. I mean, graphically it's already here. You say, okay, when, when this momenta here are hard, then of course they propagate a short distance, and therefore these two points, one here and one here, get close together. That's, that's graphics. That's not mathematics. However, when you write things explicitly in momentum space, for instance, you discover that this will come with 1 over p square, remember? But p square will be in between b lambda and lambda. And you try to, the idea is to try to show somehow that what you get is a local vertex. If you cannot do that, we'll discuss it, but make it Make, give it a try. I would like you to try to set down formula for yourself without me telling you what to do exactly. And if you can't, write a document, put it online, tell me exactly, put it in the Telegram page, tell me exactly where you got stuck. Don't just say, I can't do it. 
I can do it is not an answer for this course, at least for me. What what is a plausible answer is I try to do it. I arrive to this point. I don't know how to proceed. I don't know how to go from this point forward. That's something I'd like to answer to. Okay? So give it a, a fair try. It's part of the course. There's no way you can understand field theory if you don't give it a try to make calculations. And you have to sit in your room and try to do it. If I do it for you, you, you know, I, I've done a couple of them. And, but then the next step is you try to do it. Just as much as with physics one, you know, the professor can give you some exercise and the rope and the spring and the thing rolling down. But until you sit down and try to roll a ball on the linear plane, you haven't understood physics. So give it a try. Okay. The result of all this was a new expression for B, for the partition function, which now included uh, a term which, which had a, a lower cutoff. But remember, what we are aiming to, and this was supposed, sorry, to be sort of numerically identical to the original theory, but with a different cutoff. But remember, the entire idea of renormalization group transformation is to identify, identi it is establish an, a, an equivalent classes between physical theories. And by equivalent classes between physical theories, I mean I get different formulation of the same physical theory that have different parameters but describe the same physics. And remember, at the beginning of the course, we said the physical theory is defined by Hamiltonian and a scale. And these two theories don't have the same scale. So if we want to compare two Hamiltonians describing the same theory, we should compare two Hamiltonians with the same cutoff. So what we did was a rescaling. What we need to do is to rescale the fields. So the second step The second step we need to do is to take this expression and perform a transformation on the momentum scales in such a way that uh, we restore the same cutoffs on the left and the right hand side. So basically what we do, we take k prime equals k divided by b and x prime equals b of x. We shrink distances and enlarge momenta by the same amount. And if we do that, then this theory that sits on here becomes a new theory, but with the same cutoff as before. And now we can compare the Hamiltonian that enters in the z and in the z prime theory and see that these are two equivalent descriptions after perturbative corrections of exactly the same physical phenomena because they have the same kind of scale and blah, blah, blah. Now, if you take your effective action Hamiltonian that was the bare Hamiltonian of slow fields plus the effective terms that were coming from interacting out the hard modes, and you rescale, you get an expression like this, d3x. I will not call things x prime now. So basically, let me say, rather than putting the prime, let me say I'm sending k to k divided by p and b divided by bx. Okay? So the effective of Hamiltonian after rescaling goes into something like um, 1 over 1 half, 1 plus delta z, and now b squared with i phi negative squared. And I'm going to use two symbols to denote. Okay. defects of different things. I'm going to come to this in a moment. Then I have a terms like one half. Uh, this cannot be read in here. Let me go. Let me continue in the top. 
So I get one half, and then I get lambda negative delta lambda. Then I get uh, ah sorry, I'm forgetting the master. So one half mass plus delta mass five small squared. I think I'm not I hope I'm not forgetting factors here and there. Ah, uh, yes, I am forgetting factors. So one second. Okay. Plus one fourth lambda negative delta lambda phi negative to the fourth plus delta c grad i negative to the fourth plus delta d phi to the six plus blah 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 let me put a parenthesis here and on top of that I will get a b to the negative three so in this expression I have colored things differently the blue, sorry about this, the blue terms are those, are the new, are the corrections to the old couplings or to the new couplings that emerge by integrating out the hard fields. Just the discussion we finished ending. We just so that integrating of the hard fields can either lead to renormalizing the existing couplings or to generate new vertices altogether like the delta t vertex that we just sketched in the limit in which b is a hard scale so everything remains local uh, the b scales that enters here the red ones are the result of rescaling the momenta why do we have this because you know when you have derivatives you rescale derivatives as well right so, if you do things properly and you, and you compute how derivative terms uh, change when you end uh, a rescaling, you discover that you get uh, some contribution directly, some contribution from the measure, and that's why you get a b to the minus 3 here, because you're rescaling the measure, right? So, by, by rescaling this, you get this one. And then, of course, I get a b square from the fact that I'm rescaling the derivatives here. And I'm pretty much sure I get a, a factor of b also here, which should be b fourth, uh, by rescaling these derivatives too. Now, the new theory doesn't look like a standard field theory because we are used to standard field theory in which the derivative couplings are uh, just a, so the kinetic energy term, which in this equation is this one, are simply the square of the gradient or the phi Laplacian phi, right, by integration. So it makes sense, since the fields are integrated over, it makes sense to reabsorb this term into the field definition. In other words, send the field phi to a new field which is 1 over b, 1 plus delta z to the 1 half phi. Now, if you do that, you get yet one more expression for z prime. Now the cutoff is back to lambda. Now the integral contains a slightly different expression, which I call h prime. I think in a note, actually, to be consistent with the note, let me call it script H. And script H 
is uh, the following integral d 3x 1 half d phi square now notice I have uh, no longer beta and delta z floating around and I have plus 1 half m prime square p square plus lambda prime fourth factorial uh, phi to the fourth plus uh, delta c prime grad phi to the fourth plus delta d phi to the sixth. And I want to emphasize that I do not put the smaller symbol in here because the cutoff of these fields phi is lambda now. Is no longer lambda times b because I've rescaled the fields, the, the length scale. So these have the original cutoff, the same uv cutoff as the original theory. So basically, after I've done decimation and I've done rescaling, any time I take an extra decimation step, I go and renormalize all of the coefficients. At the first, at the, at the first decimation step, I generate new coefficients. The delta c and delta d were not there before the first decimation step. But then, if I further decimate, so I first get my layer, and then I decimate by a second layer, by a third layer, by a fourth layer. After I decimated after the first layer. Here already delta c and delta d begin to appear, and then from here on I'm changing delta c and delta c prime, delta d prime, and changing and delta d prime c second, delta d second, just as like you would integrate a molecular dynamic simulation. So basically, what I'm going to write is an equation that tells you how each of these parameters change after one extra step of decimation. This is a little bit like uh, when you do, you know, x in molecular dynamics or say Langevin dynamics, you say f x y is x s plus blah 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 blah, like in the Langevin equation, and you're telling me what is the next configuration after you do one more step of dynamics. Now we see what one more step of decimation and rescaling and reabsorption into the field. So basically, imagine a, to turn a handle in which at each roundabout of the handle, you're doing decimation, rescaling, reabsorption. And then you do another step. Decimation, rescaling, reabsorption. And by reabsorption is this multiplication of the fields of that coefficient. The result that at any turn of the handle, the mass term will change by an amount which is infinitesimal. And it's given by this. And as you can see, there are contributions both from the decimation part, the delta z and delta m, and from the rescaling. Right. Then I get a change in C, which is C plus delta C, 1 plus delta Z, B third minus 2, and D prime, D plus delta D. one plus delta z minus third b minus third okay you find all these equations in my notes I'm just writing them here for c of course in principle you can renormalize further term but you're interested only say to a given order so up to a given order in perturbation theory you only generate a finite amount of vertices now let me now each of these terms here first some comments on these results are, are, are very important in are in order all of these corrections here they are all small and finite they are small because they are proportional to powers of lambda and they are finite because we have an explicit cutoff 
in the theory. So there's no divergence. So each of these terms is a small term. So this does define a dynamical system with a small increment on the right hand side. Those of you who come from field theory may think, look, uh, all of this uh, scaling are, uh, rescaling are infinite, and what is it? this is certainly not a differential equation. Because remember, in, those of you who have taken quantum field theory, they know that the renormalization, uh, the things get re the charge of QED gets renormalized by the infinite amount, uh, which is really what is disturbing. But in Wilson renormalization group, everything gets renormalized by a small amount. That's the beauty of it. Everything is mathematically very clean and under control. Okay, so we have uh, done that. And uh, let me analyze the really, I want to analyze this to the lowest possible level of detail. And the lowest possible level of detail is one in which I completely neglect perturbative calculations. So, so basically, is the one in which I I put away all the all the delta here, which essentially is a crude approximation. But but this crude approximation is telling me something. Since the number since b is is a number smaller. Than, uh, than one, we discovered that under the summation step, some of this term in three dimension grow. Because b is less than one, one over the b square is a number greater than one. And some other operators get smaller. So after one extra decimation, rescaling, reabsorption step, some of the coefficients become bigger, and some of the coefficients remain in intact, and some of the coefficients become smaller. So the terms in Hamiltonian associated with polynomials of the fields whose coefficients grow these are called relevant terms. Relevant terms. Those for which become smaller, they're called irrelevant. And those who remain intact are called marginal. Why do we want to introduce this distinction between relevant, irrelevant, and marginal? Because you think what you're doing is building an equivalence between two physical theory, one in which I have my coupling, and another one in which the coupling have different values, and some of the coupling are smaller. And if I keep on doing it, they become smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. So in the end of the day, they vanish. So really, I don't need to care about your relevant couplings, because I can build an effective theory which is a, which up to perturbative corrections, order by order, describes the same physics in which that coupling has been set to zero by many, many steps, or has become negligible by many, many steps of RG. So that's why they are irrelevant. On the contrary, if you have a theory with relevant terms, those are those you really care. Because anytime you renormalize them, they become bigger and they kill the others. Basically, you're reabsorbing the contribution from all the others into that coupling. Those are the only ones who really matter. And then there are the marginal terms. The marginal terms are not really, I mean, they remain intact, they remain the same at this order of perturbation theory. When you start bringing in perturbative correction, they have a logarithmic change. 
but it's a sm it's a small change. It's a, it's not large scale change like a power law change, like the relevant and irrelevant. So. It is clear, I would say. Uh, one thing I would like to add on that is that we've gone through a lot of work to decide what you know, what what field were supposed to be irrelevant and what field were supposed to be irrelevant by doing all this renormalization procedure. But if you're only interested in the crude approximation in which I neglect all of the perturbative corrections and only look at the B, the rescaling part, I didn't do to, to do the perturbative corrections. I could just infer the character of, of the relevant scales, relevant and irrelevant, by dimensional analysis. How come? Well, by inferring what dimension is associated with the field. Uh, let me do an exercise that will clarify this. We take the Hamiltonian. Now, we take the Hamiltonian and we take this Hamiltonian to be in four dimension. Why four dimension? Well, because this Hamiltonian, you can think about it as being the Euclidean Lagrangian or Euclidean action at this level. And then we take uh, d phi squared half plus m squared phi squared. And then you have, a, say, lambda to the fourth, five factorial, four. And then maybe we have a phi to the phi to the three, and phi to the six. I just want to make the exercise for you to understand without doing any decimation step, which of these terms is going to grow under a normalization group, which one is going to fall, and the marginal ones, they're only for the marginal ones where the corrections are perturbative, and they only come from doing the RG calculation, for those who really need to do the renormalization work to understand whether they become marginally growing or marginally decreasing, right? So, the idea is to look and, first of all, infer the dimension of the field. Now, suppose this is really a Euclidean action, or oh, well, leave it Hamiltonian in units of kT. Remember, the, in the exponent, the Hamiltonian always enters as a, as a unit of kT. So this quantity here is dimensionless. That's all I care. So since this quantity is dimensionless, I have four units of length from this. I have two units of derivative to the minus one from here. And then I have dimension of the field squared. And this is supposed to be zero dimensional, right? Now, what happens is that from here I can infer the dimension of a field, which I denote like this, in four dimension, and the four enters here. The dimension of the field in four dimension is one, right? One unit of well, I'm a little bit confused. It should be momentum length. I think its uh, dimension is a negative one. Yeah, it's one unit of inverse length or one unit of momentum. So each of this term, of course, is dimensionless. They, all of this term here, including their coupling, they have to have dimension minus four in units, right? So, for instance, the coupling has units negative 2 and square, as it should be. 
Now let's look at this term, dimension of lambda. We have four units of inverse length for the field and four units of length for the momentum from the integration. They cancel out the dimension of lambda is zero. Let's take a look of a, of a term, let's call it uh, chi multiplying phi cube. Let's, let's infer the coupling of this uh, coupling, the dimension of this coupling constant, chi. Um, I have a negative 3 from here, plus 4 from here, which leaves me with plus 1 which means that chi must be negative 1. The dimension of this coupling constant chi must be negative 1. Let's now look at one like a c lambda to the 6, sorry, phi to the 6. Now, this has dimension minus 6 in length, this is a dimension 4, which means that this has to have dimension 2. So what we did discover? We are discovering that in these theories, in D dimension, okay, all the terms with I have terms we come with powers of alpha. When alpha is smaller than 4, the coupling constants dimension is... Uh, oh, I've just forgotten what I wrote. Let me do it again. Get chi phi to the third and d4x. And therefore, this was like negative 3 plus 4, which means plus 1, and x must be negative 1. Okay. So, so what I'm trying to say is that if I have a term with phi to the alpha, if alpha is bigger, is smaller than the number of dimensions, which in this case was 4, the corresponding coupling was negative dimension. If alpha was bigger than the number of dimension, the corresponding coupling dimension was positive. And if alpha was actually equal to the number of dimension, phi to the fourth, the coupling C alpha, which was lambda by the way, this was dimensionless. Now, when you do a rescaling, you rescale momenta, right? Now, it's clear that after, to the order in which I neglect the effect of perturbation theory, all that determines what coefficient is going to change is its dimension. Because everything else comes from the delta z, delta m, delta lambda, they come from perturbative calculation. Why the b square behavior comes only from dimensional analysis. I'm rescaling all momenta and counting how many units of length I'm rescaling in order to put the appropriate value of b. So the, the relevant or irrelevant operators, they are associated with the dimension of the operators. So anything bigger than the dimension is irrelevant. This is marginal. And anything smaller than the dimension is relevant. And in fact, in our theory, in three dimension, the mass square was relevant and the lambda square was irrelevant in three dimension. And the, and the phi to the fourth scale was irrelevant, right? So in three dimension,
m relevant m square relevant lambda to the four factorial irrelevant and there was no marginal term because the marginal term would have been a coupling phi to the cube which would have violated the symmetries and we did not put it in this means that in three dimension if I run if I perform a renormalization group at every step I get an equivalent theory in which the coupling is smaller and it's the same physics and I do it again and I get another identical equivalent theory in which the coupling is even smaller that means that the coupling is really, really, really irrelevant in this theory. There, there is no real interaction because I can build a free theory which has the same physics content up to perturbative correction of a given order in which the coupling is smaller. You see why they are called irrelevant and you see why renormalization group is such a powerful method. It allows you to forget about things and simplify the theory without losing physical content to give an order in perturbation theory. So, if I draw this in parameter space, I'm here drawing two, three parameters, and I imagine to start with a point in parameter space and perform, maybe this point has a projection here, here, And perform renormalization step after renormalization step. Maybe these two parameters are irrelevant and I get close to the origin, and maybe the third is relevant and I'm growing up. Which means I'm building up theories which have physical content unchanged almost, but they're just dominated by one single coupling, the one associated with the third dimension here in this parameter space. And in general, you, you, you can encounter situations in which you have fixed points, which means the theory that comes, and this is something I sketched at the beginning of this discussion, for very point, different point in parameter space, are RG equivalent to a universal point here. So they have really different formulation of the same theory. That's why they say they are in the same equivalent classes. I can use any of them indistinguishably. And and give uh, in describing the same physics, or I can use this theory to describe all of these theories. Now you start understanding why this was a Nobel Prize discovery, right? How deep this roots into the how the field theory formulation really builds into the heart of the physical theory exploits these ideas of changing scale and uses that to generate uh, new versions of the theory. So I want to close this discussion by making some comments. Let's see. So I want to close this lecture by making some comments. The notion of relevance and irrelevance of an operator uh, that we just discussed has an important implications even beyond statistical physics and important and in particular I'm referring now to what uh, Gerhard Tüft Nobel Prize for Physics in 1999 defined uh, used to call the spell of the gauge theories so for decades the quest for a fundamental theory of uh, fundamental interactions in physics uh, was uh, entirely focused into the notion of renormalizability of the theory. Uh, remember, a renormalizable theory is a theory in which any time you perform renormalization, you generate uh, couplings that are already present in the theory. So you don't generate new vertices. The reason for that was that 
historically, people believe that whatever theory you were supposed to um, introduce uh, was supposed to be valid throughout infinity in scales. There was not so, somehow this idea of uh, every physical theory being the effective theory of some other physical theory more microscopic in a Russian doll sort of uh, relationship um, was not propagated through physics. And uh, for instance, uh, Landau was very disappointed by noting that if you renormalize QED, uh, well, the couplings of QED uh, explodes at some point, which simply means that QED cannot be a fundamental theory of interactions. Because uh, uh, renormalization would say QED is a, a sufficiently large energy is an infinitely strongly coupled theory, which would lead to impossible consequences and not physical consequences. And in fact, later in the 70s, people discovered that QED above a certain scale um, uh, mixes with the electroweak sector, with a weak sector of a strong interaction, giving rise to electroweak theory, which doesn't have that pathological behavior. So for many, many years, until the mid 70s for sure, people were, were discarding any physics any physical theory that was not renormalizable. And in the context of the discussion we just had, renormalizability simply says that the interaction must be a marginal term. So that any running of the interaction only arises for perturbations, and, and, and therefore all the couplings of fundamental theories have to be dimensionless in four dimensions. So, for instance, in four dimensions, phi to the fourth, would be a legitimate physical theory, but phi to the six would not, because phi to the six would be irrelevant. Phi to the third, which is a relevant, would be what is called a super renormalizable theory. But uh, super renormalizable theories are those who lead to diagrams that are finite in that number of dimensions. So there's no divergence. But let's not worry about that. That is a technicality, and that has nothing to do with us. So the principle of renormalizability was a principle of theoretical physics. The discussion of the renormalization group flow that we just finished sort of scratching the surface of put us in a condition to revisit this principle from a deeper point of view and to understand as often happens in science, that what initially is postulated as a principle is in fact the result of a deeper uh, scientific structure that is not evident at the beginning and becomes evident later on in the course of science, and that principle becomes a consequence of something that is more fundamental. We have seen this when we derived the principles of thermodynamics out of statistical mechanics. You know, in the 1900s, the, the second principle of thermodynamics was postulated as a fact without any underlying motivation, just, you know, an experimental observation. However, after the development of statistical mechanics, you can actually describe the second principle in thermodynamics by giving the Boltzmann interpretation of entropy and rediscover that, indeed, the principle of thermodynamics, the laws of thermodynamics, can be basically explained by Newton's law, provided you can make use of statistics. So those principles became understood in terms of more fundamental science. And in the very spirit, the principle of, uh, after the development of the renormalization group, and after this idea have matured in the community enough to understand that basically all physical theories are effective theories or more fundamental theories, at least to the Planck scale, and who knows what happens to the Planck scale, uh, then some paradigmatic shift in the conceptions of theoretical physics sort of started to emerge. And if you think in this term, the principle of renormalizability is nothing but we don't want, it's, it's pointless to put irrelevant operators in a physical theory because under renormalization group flow, they will disappear. So if I put, say, suppose I write QED and I'm just worried with the electroweak sector, sorry, to the photon sector, uh, which is uh, the famous one fourth. I uh, cannot get my computer to 
I don't understand why my uh, ah, I'm using sorry I'm using the wrong uh, I'm using the wrong tablet window there we go so suppose I write come on now you should work why doesn't it work Okay, finally. So suppose I write the, the standard QED Lagrangian, and that's only for the electromagnetic part. I don't care about the rest for the moment. That's the Lagrangian density of QED. QED. Well, this is, of course, d mu a nu negative d mu a nu squared. So you can easily understand that this is dimensionless because the, these are bosonic fields, vector fields are dimension one, this is dimension negative one, and those, and therefore when you when you do the calculations and you combine with the extra, so they had, so these guys have dimension one, these guys have dimension one, when you square the whole thing as dimension four, the integral in front has dimension minus four in momentum units. So the Lagrange is dimensionless, fine. Suppose I wanted to add to QED a term like this. This term is again gauge invariant. However, it is not renormalizable, meaning if I use this term and I go beyond three level, anytime I do a calculation, I generate vertices that are different from the ones that are already here. Now, this was the reason why originally this term was discarded while writing QED. Now we have a better way of understanding this. You can perform a renormalization group, rescale the renormalization scale, and under this renormalization flow, you can make this term as small as you want. So it's an irrelevant term. You don't need to incorporate it in the physics. So the renormalizability of the theory is not a principle you're supposed to be asking anymore. It's, uh, it's actually a consequence of the renormalization group flow. We, theory we just devised. Now, like, as, like I've done several times at the beginning of the course where we were actually meeting in person, I want to warn you that I would say this is a... there are aspects in theoretical physics where there's not a, still a complete general consensus. I heard people uh, not being completely happy with this explanation. Whether they are a minority of very smart people uh, that resist to a stupid uh, majority change in paradigmatic shift, or if they are just a leftover of a previous generation, is not for me to say, it's for the next generation of scientists to say. You know, there was a time in the late 19th century where the majority of scientists believed in ether, and Maxwell was the heretic guy, sorry, and, and Maxwell actually, I think, believed in ether, and Einstein was the heretic guy who sort of get rid of uh, ether, right? So, I'm not making any statement here, but the only statement I feel to make is that there is at least a logical way of phrase the need of renormalizability in terms of renormalization group flow by saying that only up to renormalizable terms you're guaranteed to be including up to marginal operators. Okay, that was uh, point number one. And of course, is a comment uh, which is specifically intended for those of you who have an interest in high energy physics. And comment number two is that some uh, some pointing out to you uh, that at some point in, in the last couple of years, um, about ten years ago, we we took the challenge to to go through the renormalization procedure for the Langevin dynamics at least for a decimation. And the idea was to devise an equivalent representation of the Langevin dynamics with a lower cutoff. And the reason was precisely that of, uh, you know, if you have a lower time resolution, you can probably forget about the corrugation of the energy landscape and basically get an effective theory in which you smear out to order kt 
the frustration of your energy landscape, allowing you to use larger delta t in your simulation, therefore making less computational effort. And in order to do that, uh, we went through all this, you know, splitting of the path variable in Langevin into hard and slow components. And I'm bringing this out because it's an interesting thing. You've, so if some of you want to see a calculation of the RG done from the beginning to the end in a situation where you don't need fields, well, that's, that's a nice place to look at. I think it's the only one that I know of. And you find all possible details spelled out. So I'm not asking this, of course, for the exam. It would be very, at least to the least, inelegant to ask for students to read the paper of the lecturer for the exam. Uh, but I think it's a, an interesting piece of literature for those of you who want to see all the calculation throughout all the diagrams, since in these lectures I could only cover some of them and some of the things I have specifically glanced over. In particular, in the exercise I ask you to do, in which you must show the locality in the limit of B going to one of the effective vertex coming from, remember, uh, this diagram. And in the paper I'm going to suggest to you, you find an, ex an exact derivation of that locality limit um, uh, for a case of the Langevin dynamics, which basically will, pa will pass over unchanged for the field theory case. So let me just point out this paper to you. It's this one. You see the reference right here. It's a Fizzrev E paper, um, and you see you recognize the path integral formulation of Langevin dynamics. There we go. You recognize the existence of a natural cutoff. You recognize the splitting of the path in hard and slow components. The splitting of the path integral in two the integral over the hard components, just as we did. And then we will have diagrams. This is the propagator for the hard components, just as we did in lecture for the five to the fourth. Then you get a diagram, then you get the evaluation of the diagram, and then you show how non-local diagrams become local. And why is it so? So, you might want to go and Read it if you really want to see a calculation done from the beginning to the end, and the result is an effective theory with additional vertices and how they emerge. But of course, this will not be requested uh, for the final exam. So I will give another video later on on the exams explaining what I expect from you. I do understand that the renormalization group part is a bit harder than the rest of the course. I strongly encourage you to look at it in the notes, but also to read Peskins and Schroeder's chapter on Wilson's renormalization, from which I mostly take in those lectures. Because difficult physics must be read on books, not just on notes. And I think this is a very important thing to keep in mind. Anytime you get stuck, read a book. Because the book is the result of a person or a, or a group of people who spent an enormous amount of time trying to think about what is the best way of putting something down for people to read. And it's much more thorough than a set of lecture notes. So normally it's much deeper than lecture notes. Lecture notes are good because they give you all the material you really need to understand, but when you get stuck, my advice is always go ahead and read books. Okay, so I think this closes the material I wanted to cover in my course. Fairly happy that in the end I only had to skip a couple of topics. I skipped, I skipped a couple of topics, but I did include something slightly more about others. So I think overall I did not have to sacrifice too much content for this field course as I did, uh, as I figured at the beginning. So more or less we've done everything I had in mind to do. Uh, I already spoke about uh, the possibility of having live lectures to discuss this material and my availability to answer your questions. 
And so thank you for taking this course, and I'll be available for discussions. Bye-bye.